All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our release recap for August 2024. Uh, this year is just flying by. <laughs> Um, I'm Amanda. I'm going to kick us off with the uh, UTAS releases. So we'll talk about those first. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit inventory while I'm talking, and then we'll proceed um, with USPS and some ESS updates as well. All right. So jumping right in. Um, the USAS releases, there were three releases in the month of August. We had two of our regular releases and one hotfix release. And, okay, let me see. Oh, I think my site is good. I don't need to zoom in or anything. Um, if I do, just let me know. Oh, yeah, before I jump into, um, also, as always, if you all have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat or let us know. Um, you can unmute and um, talk as well if you like. So. All right. Okay. So the first one I have here for bug fixes uh, is uh, corrected a prior year encumbrance cash problem. So uh, this basically just ensures that correct figures display on the expenditure accounts. There was something that we found happening uh, if you were like changing the posting period to a different fiscal year, then sometimes it just was like appearing on the page as if it wasn't updating as it should. So that's corrected. Correcting a problem with reversing receipts. Uh, I looked into this one and it was like a very specific situation that we found uh, where basically if the receipt was being modified at the same time a posting period was uh, closed or changed, then um, it was still allowing that edit to happen on the receipt, even though it technically shouldn't. So that was also uh, fixed up there. Improved the creation of account summaries by ensuring the posting period event completes before the summaries are created. This has to do with uh, basically the amounts that get uh, calculated and stored for each month. So just making sure that when the posting period is closed, uh, it this was just updating the order of events, uh, making sure that uh, the creation of those account summaries or the account figures that get saved uh, are done so properly. All right, and then uh, this one was the one that was on the hotfix issue. So we also corrected a problem with the vendor unmerge operation. So uh, we had found uh, a bug where it impacted the outstanding payables only if uh, the vendor was merged and then unmerged. Um, and then this, uh, while we were doing this as well, we corrected a problem um, we found during our internal testing with the calendar year uh, selection dropdown. So, so those are the corrections uh, with bug fixes. Uh, we did have an improvement as well for performance. So uh, the performance improvement, oops, performance improvements have been made to AP invoices when saving and editing the transactions. Uh, the improvements range from 16% to 40%, depending on the size of the transaction. So uh, this is one thing that um, we had looked at, I know, especially with like very large uh, invoices when either creating those or like even trying to edit when you're saving, it was um, taking some time to actually do that save step. And so that's where we, uh, we went in to go look um for performance improvement with that process. All right, and then we had um, a couple like internal items that we put on here. Internal items are not anything that uh, you'd actually see a difference within this in the software like as a user, but um, these things are being worked on in the background. So we include them on here. Uh, implemented spring batch for account change and the future fund change process. So they did some work in the background as we um, look to get ready to add that feature. Um, this does not change the functionality of the account change process though. And then the rest controller for distributions was worked on as well. So yeah, uh, so so that's what we have for used as mostly bug fixes. So I didn't have a lot of screenshots or, or anything in the software really to show this time. But um, the good news is that you know with the bug fixes, those are things that um, we you shouldn't be see, you know you're no longer going to be seeing impacts from those. So 
Um, so lots of corrections this time around. Okay. All right, so let me just move right on. We'll roll right over into um, inventory. <laughs> sorry, Lori, I picked you out there. <laughs> um, if it's okay, I think I'm just going to go ahead and do, I'm so sorry for the scroll, but I'm just going to go ahead and do uh, inventory while I'm on, and then that way I'll, I'll be wrapped up. <laughs> uh, so we also had three releases for inventory. Um, I will go back and add the links here. It looks like uh, either I forgot to uh, click click the right button when I did that, or maybe the page didn't update. So um, I'll go back and link the actual releases in here. So this will be available. Um, but uh, as far as inventory as well, so this one also a lot of bug fixes. Um, so we'll go through those. take a breath here before I jump right in because we got, we have a decent size list here as well. All right. So um, first we updated, um, we prevented defaulting the, uh, the last fiscal year um, close date if there's not a closed fiscal year. So this one is something that uh, I believe has to do with like when you're, when a, um, an instance would be like first started. So if like um, they're migrating to inventory or like starting new in inventory. Um, so yeah, it is specific to new instances that are set up. And uh, where this is, where you would see this is the core configuration. And um, it'll remain blank until the fiscal year has been um, closed in the inventory application. So Here's a little screenshot. I got this from the documentation, so it's kind of grayed out, but it's this very last box here. Last closed fiscal year is tracked. Um, so that dates get gets tracked, and I believe that that is used in reference to um, calculation of certain fields, um, just how it's showing in the software. And so um, basically, like, it, so it's no longer going to default it. Uh, when the system first starts up, basically. And then as soon as the first year closes, that appropriately updates. And that just ensures that um, how uh, certain data is showing at that startup phase is, um, is done correctly. Uh, the next thing also for a situation where this is like a new district, and this is also specifically when they're not migrating from Classic, so if you have any districts that uh, maybe they're starting on inventory after using like a valuation service or or like um, like third party or uh, something like that, and they want to start a brand new instance, we had found a problem where the start date was populating as 630 and the start date of the year should be 71. So that was fixed. And then there was also a note on um, on there that districts that had the incorrect dates, um, they had patched those as well. So, so that's that's fixed. So that's um, said to go for uh, future um, scenarios. This next one, we corrected some internal errors when filtering and sorting the item grid, which um, I was really happy to see this one on here because I know that item grid has a lot of really helpful information. Um, when you go in, there's all sorts of um, pieces of information you can add to the grid. But what was happening sometimes is, uh, and they were sort of inexpl inexplicable or seemingly, um, where you go in to put a sort and you're kind of trying to look something up Sorry, I'm trying to make sure my light stays on and <laughs> hit the wrong button. Um, but uh, they would get internal errors. So, um, so basically what they did is they looked into this and they determined three main issues were causing the errors. Uh, so I kind of went through their notes to uh, summarize this. All of these three um, scenarios that they located that were causing the internal errors on that item grid uh, have, have been addressed. So these will no longer happen. Uh, but one thing we were seeing is that sorting the location code, if a tag did not have a location category. So sometimes if you'd put in like say a date filter and then you're like, oh yeah, I also wanna narrow down the location. 
if any one of the tags in that group didn't have a location category, then it was just giving an internal error and it wouldn't uh, complete the grid sort. So now, even if that's the case, it'll still be able to sort. Attempting to enter a range for original cost. So uh, that original cost field previously didn't have that uh, capability, so it was causing an error. Now it does. So if uh, you wanted to see a range of items where the original cost was between 1000 and 2000 that is um, an option for, for the filtering on the, on the item grid. The last one was even more specific. It was if a filter was entered on the original cost for like an amount, and then um, after that, attempting to enter a calendar filter, but it started with a zero, then it was causing an error. So that one's been addressed as well. Uh, the next one, this is also an internal error. Uh, and we wanted to clean some of these up too, because I know the internal error isn't very descriptive. So um, it's hard to know um, what's going on here. And uh, this one, we found there was an internal error being thrown. And I believe this was specific to when like saving or editing an item. And it happened if the depreciation method was blank. So uh, when creating new items, I, you can't leave this field blank. So this is something that only um, applies to existing items. And it was basically giving like a null or a, like blank is uh, null is like zero or blank. Um, it was giving that error. So that has been corrected as well. Uh, and just a note to like, this is for when the field was like actually nothing in there. It was just an empty field, not if it was none. Because if the, dep the depreciation uh, method, there is an option called none. And so if it has that, it's not um, this scenario either. <laughs> Okay, and then the last two on here were for our hot fixes. So the first one had to do with reports. Um, the schedule of fixed assets. Uh, so on the fixed assets reports, we had a report that um, the original cost was looking different between the summary and detail versions. And what we found was that one of them was picking up the, um, the disposed of items. So uh, this issue corrected that to make sure that it's properly handling the disposed of items. So both the detail and the summary version now will appropriately be able to calculate um, with the with the correct using the correct items. And the last one here was our most recent hot fix. We corrected the pending items grid so that the pending items display properly. Um, this doesn't mean that they are going to look any different than they did before. Uh, what we found was uh, we had a short period of time where um, an update had caused, uh, basically the pending items grid wasn't showing anything. <laughs> so even if they had pending items in there and they ran a pending items report and they had items, uh, that should show in their inventory software when they went to the pending items grid, it just wasn't showing anything. So uh, we um, had some reports of this, we found a bug and then um, updated this with a hotfix right away because we know uh, that's something where you need to be able to see the transaction. So uh, now that's all fixed. So this, you shouldn't expect to see anything different. Uh, this was just making sure that they look um, normally as they should. Okay, any questions on USAS? Any questions on inventory? All right, well, uh, that's all I have on those then. And um, Lori, if you wanna um, pick us up on payroll, I'm ready. <laughs> all right, let me get my screen here. Okay, we will go ahead and um, talk about payroll. In the month of August, we had three regular releases and then two hot fixes. So we'll talk about those. Um, when it comes to the bug fixes um, in several of the improvements, we you'll notice that a lot of these pertain to um, 
issues that were needed for ESS. So, um, you know, several of these bug fixes, those, those pertain to, you know, payroll needing, or I'm sorry, ESS needing that information from payroll. So um, those changes were, were needed um, for, for that purpose. So the first being um, the employee and position um, rest controllers were, were um, handled to, um, were, were changed so that custom field property name changes were handled correctly. Um, so that's what the first issue or bug fixes pertaining to. Um, the second is that for, again, ESS and ASAP integration, um, they needed a phone number. Um, so you'll see this first enhance or improvement, the first bullet was to add that phone number that this service needed. Um, and there was um, a, a bug that was introduced when this improvement was um, released. So that bug fix then um, went out on a hot fix. Um, we listed that here, it's um, 2024.14.1. So that was, um, you know, just to correct the, um, release that went out, the improvement went, that went out and introduced that bug. So these two go hand in hand. And then thirdly, um, again, still pertaining to ESS, um, when, it, when it came to um, employee onboarding, um, we weren't correctly checking um, the ineligible leave units. Um, so it was producing an error if, the if there was a leave unit not defined. Um, so now that has actually um, been corrected, so to speak, and there will be an error produced if um, that record is saved and there's not a leave unit defined. So if the employee or, you know, if the, the user saves that and there's not a leave unit defined, even on ineligible leave um, types, then there will be an error produced. Also, um, there's an error check um, to make sure that all the leave units are the same. So if there's a mismatch and you have one set to daily, one set to hourly, then there's also an error that's produced upon saving that record that indicates, um, you know, those are different and um, those will have to be updated before the save can be completed. And then lastly, um, when it comes to bug fixes and not pertaining um, to ESS, um, was the correction to the leave projection report. Um, there was an issue with holidays and those were being um, listed on the report multiple times. So we've included an example here. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, you can see that both of these a little bigger, maybe that will be helpful. Um, the the date on both of these lines is for the fourth of July, so we've you know um, corrected that. So holidays will only be listed on the report one time as they should. All right, moving on to the improvements. Um, the first bullet we talked about that goes hand in hand with. Um, adding the phone number and um, the bug that was introduced um, when we when we release that. So we'll move on to the second, and that's um, an improvement to the new contract report and the ability now for this report to to filter on um, the new pay group and the job calendar value. So before I can hop over here and show you what I mean, um, if we have an example here of um, a new contract. And if I would go in and I would change the pay group, it would actually um, defer to the old pay group and not look at the new pay group. So if I change this now to let's say, um, we're just gonna do Violet, pay group 10, and I go to the new contract report, whoops, 
selected the wrong thing here. And I actually select that new violet, pay group 10. I would expect then that my new contract to show up. And before it was looking at the old, um, the, the prior information, um, the prior value on those two fields. Um, so we, these records would actually be excluded. So we've made an improvement to now look at those values correctly um, so that they do appear on the new contract report um, as they should. The next improvement, and I hope this helps eliminate a lot of um, you know, confusion and um, misunderstanding when it comes to running the SERS per pay report and forgetting to create that adjustment file. Um, I, if for those of you that were classic users, you know, when the submission file for SERS was created, it automatically created the regular file and then the adjustment file, um, you know, all in one step. So that's exactly what we've done here now. Um, so that when that submission file is created, it will now also include that adjustment file. So if I go ahead and I go to SERS, the SERS per pay report, and I then um, just, you know, put in the information for this 418 payroll. Whoops. When I click the generate submission file option, you're gonna see then two files automatically are created. So if I just go to my downloads here, you're gonna see one is listed with the, the date and it has an A after it. And then the other is just the regular um, file. So those two files are now automatically generated. Now what districts wanna be conscious of, and we've you know outlined this here, is that no matter if there is an adjustment um, in this particular you know submission or not, that adjustment file always is going to be created. So it's automatically creating both of those because you know users were just forgetting altogether to create it. So now it's automatically created and then they would open the file, to see if there's any information that needs to be reported and uploaded to ESERS. So they will, you know, automatically get two files no matter what, and then they need to open that file to see whether that file needs to, that adjustment file contains information and needs uploaded um, to ESERS. But it, hopefully this will eliminate them forgetting to generate that file um, altogether. They just need to be conscious. And I'm not sure, it, the, I would assume, you know, if they upload that blank or empty adjustment file, um, ESERS would, there would be some kind of error message um, on that end um, to tell them that, you know, there's nothing in the file or um, I'm not really 100% sure how that would look on the, the ESERS size, ESERS, ESERS side, sorry. But at any rate, those that file is automatically created, and those files are also, you know, copied to um, the file archive. So if for whatever reason, you know, they need to go back and and, and grab that adjustment file um, to report it, you know, at a later date or <clears throat> for whatever reason, it will be in the file archive, and it's right, you know, under the year um, dash that e um, SERS reporting file. Okay, hopefully that clears up a lot of, you know, confusion when it comes to missing, um, getting that information reported. Um, next then um, is another ESS um, improvement, and that was to also include or send over to ESS um, the, the other and the secondary email fields. We were on it, we were just, um, including the primary email field. Um, so that was, you know, changed. And now the secondary and other 
email field will be in, included in the information that's sent over um, to ESS as well. We also made an improvement to the um, payroll um, onboarding to now include the employee and the employer um, withholding maximums. So I provided a screenshot here. You'll see now that you know you can enter those maximums on the employee onboarding side and not have to wait to do that. Um, you know when the records are created in payroll and you know have to to input that information on the the payroll item um, itself when it gets to when it gets you know activated and pushed over. When it comes to direct deposits, I know we've had this. Um, you know, enhancement uh, uh, requests for some time now. So we now will include year-to-date totals for any payroll items that were withheld for the current uh, year. So whether they're withheld during the current payroll um, that's being processed or not, the direct deposits will always include that year-to-date total. So, I'm gonna show you quick here. I have an example just so you can get the feel of what I'm talking about. So if I go to this employee's um, payment and I open this up, um, you can see here pretty much it's the basic, you know, federal, state, city, um, retirement, Medicare, and OSDI. However, if I print this employee's direct deposit, and I've already um, created this here, you can see here that this is the date of the payment, that it also includes, again, the federal, the state, the city, the um, retirement, the OSDI, Medicare, but it includes these annuities here. And you can see here the amount under the amount column it's listed as zero, but it includes the year-to-date amount. Um, so if, you know, because this annuity was withheld at some point in this calendar year, those year-to-date totals are now included on the direct deposit form, okay? When it comes to the employer um, amounts that are listed, keep in mind, that this is controlled by the payroll item configuration um, that print employer checkbox. So if I would go down to the particular annuity that I'm um, talking about, in the options field, you can see here this field print employer amount checkbox controls what is printed or included on, on those direct deposits. So if this was unchecked, even if the, there was an amount that was withheld throughout the fiscal year, those, um, those that line would not print on the employee's form at all, um, even if it was withheld you know, during this payroll or not. Um, this flag here controls how um, what's printed then and included in the direct deposit itself. Okay. All right, and we have a note of that here. Just make sure you know that that's just a reminder that that's what's controlling um, the printing of those employer amounts. Lastly, then um, we've added the ability to mass delete attendance records. So another um, enhancement that has been requested for um, some time now. If I want to um, delete multiple records, I no longer just go down and click, you know, the X's one by one. I can actually, you know, maybe use my filtering somehow, um, whatever is relevant to um, the situation. And then I can actually just mass delete those. So if I wanted to, let's grab a good example here. Um, Let's just get some attendance pulled up on our grid. And let's see if we have some multiples. Yeah, yeah, this is a good example. So say I want to mass delete 
all of these records for this employee. Um, instead of, you know, doing them one by one, I have my grid filtered, you know, as I need it to be. I'm going to select all, all of those records that are, are selected, and I can cl click my delete option. You know, there's a pop-up box that says, are you sure? I'm going to click delete, and it deletes those records for me in just a couple clicks instead of doing them one by one. So maybe there's been a file that got posted, you know, imported, um, and it contains the wrong information. You know, rather than going one by one, we can now mass delete those records. Again, you will not be able to delete or mass delete records that are not deletable. So, you know, I can't um, select records that are not highlighted here. Um, or not deletable and, and mass delete them just like I could not delete them individually. So that same check is in place. Okay. So that's mass deleting attendance records. Um, there is, I put a note here, um, the standard read only user will not have the ability to mass delete. So, um, you know, just a, a note of of um, what roles, you know, can or cannot, um, do not have that ability. When it comes to new features, um, another really exciting um, enhancement was the ability to now run um, a canned um, account history report. Um, we did have some template reports that we attempted um, to mimic um, the classics account history report. Um, there's the, the template report here called um, SSDT account history report. And then we tried to make that a little better and we released the SSDT account history report version two. Um, it still wasn't quite up to where, you know, we needed it to be to actually replicate the account history report in classic. I know that um, there were some accounts that were missing. I think if, if it was like specific miscellaneous, um, the type, those were missing from this version two report. So you had to kind of run um, an extra report and take an extra step to get exactly the information you needed. We no longer have to do that. Okay, so if we go to the a canned account history report, um, you can see down here, there's an account selection, and this is probably what's gonna be most helpful. Um, you can use the percent sign um, to represent multiple digits, multiple numbers, so a wild card. And we have a note here as well. Um, but again, you know, if districts wanna run this for maybe a grant account, um, they're now able to do that, and it's gonna capture the right information and the right figures. Um, I have a couple examples here. Um, you can see here, I just ran this for, you know, a very specific um, time period to just get a, a, a sample of what the report looks like. You know, it's it's the newer um, updated version of the look and feel of our report. So I think it's very easy to read, um, you know, very, very clean and um, I just love it. So here's what it looks like if I, you know, pick a sample of a very specific time period. And then here's an example of me using a filter um, and just getting, you know, a specific account. So again, um, very clean and easy to look at, easy to read. Um, so hopefully districts are gonna love this. It's gonna give them the information they need and it's, you know, it, it looks really nice. So something they've, again, they've been waiting for for a while and hopefully, um, you know, they're happy with it. Great. Um, Rhonda commented that she used this report this week and it was really helpful being able to filter for specific account dates and, and you know, dimensions. So that's that's great. That's exactly what we, you know, are hoping it, it how it can be used and, um, I think, again, I think districts are really going to going to like it. Again, you can get, you know, very specific. I didn't go through all the other options of the report, but you can use, 
you know, this based on um, ending dates to and from, pay dates to and from, you know, specific pay groups, specific employees, and then obviously the the account, um, you know, factor that everybody's been been wanting for a while. Okay. And then lastly, we had um, some patches, you know, again, as Amanda mentioned, these aren't usually anything that, um, you know, are visible on the UI. Um, we had one that was specific to um, a couple districts. So, you know, nothing that the user should see, um, but sort of all behind the scenes that, that needed to happen for specific situations. That's all I have on the payroll side. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything they need would like to discuss when it comes to anything we talked about relating to payroll releases? Okay, I will stop sharing then and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to talk about ESS. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you all can see my screen here. Just setting things up here a little bit. Okay, awesome. Okay, um, going over to the recap here. Um, as you can see, <laughs> in August, we were pretty busy with employee self-service. Um, we had uh, five releases, nine hot fixes, and approximately 75 issues that were resolved. Um, and so um, if I would cover all of these, we would be here all day. Seriously. Um, so uh, what I'm what I've done is for the bug fixes and the improvements, I have categorized them so they're easier to see where in the UI they were improved. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, but what I'm going to focus on in the recap to not keep you here for another two hours um, is to um, discuss some of the um, improvements and new features that were done in August. Um, so like I said, you can you know go through these uh, bug fixes and a lot of these improvements and um, be able to um, you know see what had happened in those areas that related to like leave requests and leave calendars and things like that. Um, but like I said, I'm just gonna focus on uh, some of those improvements and some of the major new features that were done. So if you have any questions, please put them in chat or, or un unmute your mic and, and we can go through those. So first one I wanna talk about is um, we added an air message when a leave request is entered with the same date and start time um, as an existing one. So I kind of wanted to take you through that. So I'm gonna go in and demo. <clears throat> and so I'm logged in and when I look at, at um, as Susan, and when I go in and look at my leave requests, um, so this was one of the improvements that were made. And uh, I have um, an actual one, I'm gonna this over a little bit filter on initiated. And I actually have one already entered for September 10th. Okay. And so, and it's for a half day of vacation. Now, if I would go in then and create a new one for that same day, and go ahead and create this, <clears throat> what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get this error message up here now that says, the leave request with the following start and stop dates already exists. Um, so it's not, it's going to prevent because it's an actual error, it's in red, it's not a warning. Um, so it will um, prevent that from happening. And you know, when you look at it too, my times, um, you know, I've got uh, the times listed here as well. Um, so one thing is, and kiosks work the same way, is that it's not going to go in and because they put in a half day, force them to put in a time um, for that period. Um, so, um, you know, they do have to be 
um, conscious when they're in here of going in and entering um, their time if they want it to show here correctly. Um, so that was one of the things that was covered. Also, if I go in um, and one thing that you'll notice too is let's say I go in here and I create one, I'm gonna do it on a day. I don't think I have one, 12th here. Um, you know, one thing you'll notice as well that is new is I go in here and create this. <clears throat> I think I'm still going to use vacation leave on this one. I click create. And it tells me that the operation was successful and it created the leave. Um, one thing too um, is underneath my leave requests, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at that one that I just created, and it was on the 12th here, and I'm going to um, view it first. And um, these tabs are really important, and um, it's something to focus on with your districts to explain how beneficial these tabs are. I know it's easy for them just to Go in and say, oh, here's my here's my leave request information. You know, something I entered in, and I just want to look it over. Um, right, but there is more information than just what's on this first screen. So that's something when you're doing training is to kind of you know make sure that you cover all three of these so they're comfortable with all of them. On this screen, the employee's name is not on it. Yes. Um, I am aware of that. We um, have had a couple of tickets on that. So that's something that uh, um, I, I get it because for one, um, as an approver, going and try to approve leave, they're not, and they're you know going down the line and they're viewing them. They're like, who, who am I on? Um, it does show it here underneath the leave request approval trail. So the approver can go to this one and say, to Susan's. Um, and also um, it goes in and, and also shows the workflow that was tied to it. That's why, again, these three tabs are, are important. But um, I you know, can also see it would be helpful to have it on here as well so that they can see it right away instead of having to go to the approval trail to see who it is. So, so good point there. Uh, but yeah, in here, you know, they're going in and kind of looking at, okay, this is um, what's happened, but um, this daily details is also where we've improved things um, this last month and added the start and stop times on here. So if I do want to go in and um, edit this, you know, I meant to put in the start and stop times, but I did not. Um, I can go in here or go in the prior uh, tab there and go in and make a change here to say, yeah, I want this from eight until probably, well, um, it's a half day. Um, and then when I close this or when I save this then, you know, it's, it's properly put that in there. Um, and if I go back to the leave request details too, it's not updated, <laughs> all right. I'm gonna go ahead and close out and go back into that one and make note of that. Yeah, um, those should be, um, I feel those should be updated. You know, if I've got it updated here, it should be reflected in the leave request and vice versa. Um, so I'll make note of that one. But yes, but this is what we added in here is we added, you know, these start and, and stop times and ability to increment and stuff like that. So, oh, thank you, Mary. We do have a feedback issue for that. Um, so it's uh, feedback issue 95. Okay, so that was one of the things that was enhanced on the leave request forms underneath those daily details is having the time uh, information on there. Um, also, another thing, I'm going to go back in and, and create a new leave request. And what you're going to see, too, is we did include information down here in regards to the length of the absence. Um, we're denoting if it's a daily or an hourly um, increment. So, and this one says for this person, it's incremented by day. So it's a half day. Um, and also, um, 
we also incremented the time here to every 15 minutes. Now you can overwrite that. If, um, you know, if it's supposed to be 105, then you can enter in 105. But what we did here is we enhanced this so it's 15 minute increments on here. Um, so those were kind of the newer enhancements or improvements that were made to the leave request form. Um, another improvement I wanted to talk about was allowing um, district managers, leave managers, and admin to cancel approved leave requests. So I just want to show you how that's done. So I'm going to log out of Susan, and I'm going to go into somebody that has leave manager role. Uh, yeah, leave manager role, and that should be Hatfield. And so in here, she is a leave manager. She's not an approver, um, but she's a leave manager. And so what she can do under leave requests, she will have the view district leave option with her role. And in here, she's able to see all of these um, existing uh, leave requests that are out here for all district staff. And so, and you'll see over here, looking at the approval status, um, way off here to the right. Um, and you'll see based on whatever the approval status is, she could go in and cancel some of these requests. So um, she could go in and I'm, I'm just gonna filter by initiated. And in here, um, sorry, not initiated. <laughs> Let me get that out of there. Okay. Um, in here then on these, if because you know she wasn't an approver or anything like that, she could go in and, and cancel any of these um, approved leave. I meant to filter on approved, sorry about that. So as you can see, she's going in here and if these need to be canceled, even though they've been through the workflow process, being leave manager, she has the ability then to go in and cancel these leave requests. So I kind of wanted to show that option. And another one and a big topic um, that um, is still, I know there's a lot of feedback requests on are leave calendars. And, um, you know, we've got some, you know, feedback uh, requests to enhance some of that. And um, we're going to talk about the feedback requests here at the end. Um, but we are trying to make some changes in here as well and update. So I'm going to go into an approver role. So I'm going to pick on Brenda Mullins here and log in as her. And I'm going to go into the leave calendars and in the supervisor leave calendar, she's a supervisor. And some of the enhancements that we've done in here is making it, and I like how we put this in the JIRA issue, human readable format. <laughs> um, and just so they understand, okay, I am... Susan's a um, supervisor. And so I'm looking at, you know, my, the supervisor leave calendar. And so I see here that on, you know, uh, September 10th, Susan has a vacation day here um, and it's for a half day. So it's just easier to uh, understand that. So th those were some of the updates we made there. Um, another enhancement that we made an improvement was uh, blackout dates. And it's showing a confirmation dialogue when a blackout date um, would cancel existing leave requests. So a leave request is already out there. Um, and I'm gonna pick on Veterans Day's coming up. Um, so a leave request is, is already out there for Veterans Day. And then the district goes in and creates a blackout date for that day. So that's what I'm gonna take you through. So. I have got one already. Um, Susan created one for uh, November 11th. And so uh, in the, and I'm going to go to the admin here. I know I keep jumping around here, but helps to see it as that particular role or user. And I'm going to pick on the admin. And underneath uh, the I think it's underneath lead manager. Um, one thing that's been happening with our menus, you'll see that some things might 
the menu options might move around here in the releases. And um, so, you know, some of this stuff, this was like its own option. And in the latest re uh, release or the upcoming one, uh, we've moved it back underneath Lead Manager because it really is under their role. Um, and so um, you'll see that moved around. So if you see things like that, it's normal. Um, they're just trying to get the, the uh, menu out there to something that's um, easier and flows better. Um, so yes, yeah, so under blackout dates, um, if I were to go in now, um, one other thing I wanted to show you before that, I'm sorry, is underneath configuration. And if I go to the leave type configuration, I have it, um, I, I can have it set to disallow uh, blackout dates. And I'm gonna close out of here. And then what I will do is I go up to the um, blackout dates here. So that's basically restricting them um, from creating a blackout date. And then, um, or to create a leave request on a blackout date. And then I go in here and click on create, and I'm gonna say Veterans Day. And the start date is the 11th. And that's the end date as well. And uh, the leave type, um, I can just pick vacation if I want to. I can just, you know, leave it blank to include everything and then enable this. And then when I click on create, I'm going to get this message. This is the enhancement that was made. So it says there is one leave request that will be canceled or updated due to this blackout date. So do you wish to create the following blackout date? So it's telling you. Now it's not telling you exactly which one it is. That can be filtered by going out to that and seeing who that is. Um, but I believe that um, they will get a notification as well. I think um, that that is going to be um, canceled um, because of this blackout date that's being created. So if I click on save, it will create the blackout date. And then that leave request for Susan is going to be canceled because it's restricting her um, from creating a leave request, which is kind of a bonus because, you know, it is a blackout date. No one's working that day. So it'd be, you know, she already put in a, a day, a vacation day for that. You're canceling it. So she doesn't, you know, use a vacation day in a day that's a holiday. Um, so that's basically what that is doing. Okay, um, a couple other improvements I want to touch upon is that um, one thing, um, and this is, you know, may not be aware of, but when a user logs in to ESS, it is going to sync their leave balances upon login. So it is going to do that. Now we do have a position sync that we improved. Um, and uh, what we did is we scheduled that to be a nightly job. And the best way to see that is, um, you know, depending obviously on the role, on your role is, you know, with um, district manager or admin role um, underneath batch, batch jobs here, you're able to see those position syncs um, that are done on a nightly basis. So we've got that set up to run nightly and the job name is called position sync job. And so that will be done um, and updated. Not a very good example because it shows that it failed on this one, but this is where those will be located under the batch jobs. Um, so lots of different jobs um, that are being scheduled. And I know we have uh, future JIRA issues too, where it's gonna be more scheduled uh, jobs. And so all of that information will be listed underneath the batch job option. Okay, so those were some of just, I touched upon just a few of the um, improvements that were done in the past month in ESS. Um, what I wanted to go into next is some of the major features um, that were done um, in ESS in the last month. And one of them is we did a lot of work on timesheets. We've been doing a lot of work on timesheets the last couple months to get that ready. 
Uh, and so it is ready. There's no like uh, blockers um, to prevent somebody from um, using the timesheets. But what I wanted to show you, and I went over, we had a Fridays with Fiscal last week. Um, so if you weren't able to attend that, um, we have it recorded. We are going to go over timesheets at OEDSA if you're, if you're going to the OEDSA conference. But I just wanted to point out where in the documentation um, this timesheet information um, is at. And so what we did, I'm going to go into our user manual here. and I'm going to go down to the appendix. And what we've done is we've created a timesheet guideline. And in here, it just discusses, the guideline just talks about the um, parts of the timesheet that are, are involved. When you're setting somebody up with timesheets, um, how the workflows um, are being done. And also, once you, you know, enable timesheets, those options that pop up and are now displayed on the menu, what those are. And so this guideline just kind of takes you through those different parts that are affected once you enable the timesheet underneath the ESS functionality. Um, and then we took it a step further and we also um, created an initial setup checklist. So this is kind of the guideline that's the entire picture. But if you just want like, okay, what do I need to do in order to get a district set up uh, with timesheets is you can click on this initial setup checklist and it's also located down under here is like under child pages underneath this uh, timesheet guideline. And when I click on that, it takes you into the step-by-step -step on what you need to do. So it's gonna take you through what needs to be configured with links to the documentation that explains those options in more detail. Um, the workflows, you know, once timesheets are enabled, timesheet groups and group chains are um, uh, also have a, or I'm the group chains out there options underneath user. They have the lead request right now. They're also now, once this is enabled, they're going to have a timesheet option um, displayed on there. And what's what they just showed us yesterday that's going out on the release is there is going to be a copy feature, which is really cool. So if I have a lead request group, I want to copy it over to a timesheet group, I can do that. And it will take all of that and, and copy it to the timesheet. So obviously, we'll be updating the documentation once that goes out. And then down here is the role of the timesheet manager and what they have to do um, to actually go in and start creating timesheet periods and um, the shifts. Um, so this checklist basically gets you all started um, on what you need to do to get a district set up. Now, I know you're all probably crossing your eyes like, I'm just trying to get them through. ESS conversion, that's fine. You know, this is something if, you know, you think, okay, you know, once we get through this and get our districts comfortable with leave requests in ESS, get some of these features um, out there, you know, that we still are working on to help with making things easier in ESS. Maybe you don't want to do timesheets until start of, you know, next, next year sometime. That's fine. Um, but we just wanted to get this stuff out here because we do have a handful of districts that were using timesheets and kiosks. Uh, so we wanted to make this available. So and I think there were just like maybe five or six. Um, we wanted to get this available and put this out here. So those ITCs have this information. So the rest of you may say, oh, I'll wait a little bit um, and, you know, get my districts comfortable with this later. That's fine. But we wanted to get this out there for you. I'm going to go back to the guideline. The other thing I wanna talk about is down at the bottom, um, we also have, um, and it's down here as well, is, um, okay, once I get them configured, how do they go in and enter stuff? And this is what this uh, checklist will do. Um, so it's basically saying for a user, this is what they need to do to create, submit, and view their timesheets. As a supervisor, this is what they need to do to view those timesheets, to approve them. And then the timesheet manager, this is the information that they can do, um, is going in and maybe escalating one if they need to, just viewing what's out there and exporting the timesheet so that they can be posted into USPS. 
Um, so, so yeah, so we kind of put this out here to kind of help with that. So when that does happen, um, you've got this information. And obviously, just a disclaimer, these are probably going to get updated and enhanced when we get more feedback and, and more work done on timesheets. Um, so, but we thought this was a, a good starting point for you guys. Okay. Um, another, so going kind of back to um, outside of timesheets time and going back to ESS here, uh, another thing uh, that we've done, well, and this is really in regards to leave requests or timesheets, is underneath the configuration, uh, one of the new features we added is underneath the email configuration is this application link. And so uh, we had to make that change, I think, because of timesheets. Um, and so what this does is, and I, and I know that was like a big disclaimer on that release. I think it might've been 2024.3 or 2024.4, um, where we said, you know, you need to go in and add the district's ESS address, email or URL to, to this. And what this will do is when they get an email, like an approver, um, you know, somebody submits um, a leave request and the approver gets the email message, this link will then allow them to see the ESS link on their email. So if this isn't in here, they will not get a link to their um, ESS application in the email. It's a, it's a big convenience, really. So when they do get that email saying you need to approve these leave requests, they can go right to that link in the email. and It'll take them directly into ESS and allow them then um, you know, to, to go in and approve those leave requests. So that's what this was for. Um, so if you know if you those if those haven't been added right now, they still get the leave requests. They just don't have that link that will, you know, take them into ESS to approve them. They'll have to, you know, log in, you know, find their, find it on their bookmark and, and log in and do it. But this is just more of a convenience factor. Um, so that was one of the new features we did. Um, regarding ASAP, there were, and you'll see it, you know, on our um, recap, we, we did a lot of uh, ESOP, ASAP absence management um, updates as well. Um, and we're behind on the documentation on those. Not everything's up to speed. So um, I'm not really going to cover the ASAP integration uh, updates at this point. Uh, I ran out of time in, in reviewing all of this, um, but we are going to cover them at OEDSA. Um, it's going to be part of our ESS session, and uh, we'll be covering some of the uh, newer features that were added um, with the ASAP. And it's more about the configuration information, kind of behind the scenes stuff, but, um, um, but we'll talk about that more at OEDSA. Um, one of the other just recent um, enhancements, which I think is pretty cool, is the ability for uh, the supervisors or uh, certain roles um, that lead managers and stuff like that, district managers, the ability to go out there and view your um, staff's lead balances. Um, and so what we've done is we've created a um, district leave analysis option and a supervised leave analysis option. So I'm going to log in as a supervisor here and go back to Brenda. And if I go under leave request here, yes, um, she has a supervised leave analysis option now. So I kind of wanted to go over on how this works. So when I click on this, what it does is it goes out there and shows her, her staff, and currently what their leave information is. So basically it's the leave information on a grid for all of her staff. Um, so, so she can see exactly, you know, what's, you know, you know, what Levi has right now, um, you know, also is accumulations information, the max. So if there are some things in here where the supervisor is like, yeah, I really don't care about that, I could go in and remove some of these so it doesn't look as full, you know, on here. 
Um, but it also shows them, you know, what, what their current balances are as well. So that's that's really nice. You've got their vacation leave balance, their personal leave balance, their sick leave balance, um, so they can see. Now, if I wanted to go in then and say, okay, I want to pick on Levi and I want to see all of their leave requests for him. Once I check mark, click on him, I can then go into see leave for selected. And the grid below then is going to show me all of Levi's uh, leave requests that are out there. Um, and so obviously I can filter in here as well to see exactly what I want to see. Um, one other thing too, is that these would do have export options to export this information um, into a spreadsheet. So that's nice as well, but uh, that's basically what um, the, the staff leave is doing. So based on the employees uh, that fall underneath um, him, he can go out there then and see their information. Now I can also log in as, I'm gonna log in as the lead manager role. And the other one that we added here is under leave management, we have a district leave analysis. And that includes everybody. Um, and so again, they can filter on who they want. And once they select that person, then they can go in, I'll pick on Levi for this one. And then they can go in then and see leave for selected. So they could pick multiple here. They don't have to pick just one. And then I'll drop down then and we see all of Levi's leave requests in here. So that's what those two options do. I think it's a, a great tool um, for you know, some of these people to know that, hey, you know, I've got this um, ability to go out there and see where my staff is, you know, in regards to their leave balance information. Is the approved leave included in the balance? So, so Brenda, are you talking about above here, like the sick leave balances, personal leave balances, and vacation leave balances? I don't believe it is. I believe that that is their current leave information. I'm, I'll confirm that, but I think that's what that is. I don't think it's going to include what's outstanding here, but um, I'll I'll make sure of that. We'll write that one down, and if we need to explain that more in the documentation, we will. It's a good question. Um, the last. One I want to talk about in regards to a major improvement, and I know everybody's been asking for this, is the self-registering. Um, we just put that out, I think, on this last release. Can't keep them track of all of them. Um, and so I'm just going to sign out. And where um, they can self-register is underneath here, register user. And what I want to take you through is not actually doing the option, I want to take you through the documentation because I know that's where you're going to refer your districts to is look at the documentation to see how you can self-register. And I appreciate any feedback on it, um, but I just updated that a couple of days ago. And so um, it is on our main page. So I'm going to go back up to our user manual. And when I click on that, it takes us right to um, our main login page information. And this is what was just updated is we've broken this out um, by, you know, logging into employee self-service using forgot password, using username, forgot username and using the registered user. And so what we've done is we've basically taken if your kiosk account was converted over to ESS, and you know, it explains what happens. And if you need to reset your password, you go to the forgot password link. Um, and then this is the one I wanna talk about is if you are new to the district and you did not have a kiosk account, you can self-register by going to register user. It'll take us right to that area. And yeah, I'm not sure why I did that, but I'm gonna, there. and so, This is the register user area. And so it should have linked me right there. So I gotta look into that. Um, but if your district would prefer um, that you self-register, 
um, you can take them right to this and it will explain and take them through the steps of how to self-register. Now, one thing I want to mention because it's very important is as you can see, next, make this a little bit bigger here, is that it, they do require the employee number. So the, the user will need to know their employee, their USPS MP ID number in order to um, in order to create their own account. So that's one thing um, that definitely needs to be kept in mind. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna enter in their username and it, you know, it's up to the district if they want them to use a specific username like uh, first initial last name or something like that. Um, um, but it, they'll go ahead and enter that in. They're gonna enter in their employee ID and they're going to enter in the email address. And this is another thing. This email must match one of your email addresses in USPS employee record. And I think that might tie, tie, uh, tie back to what Lori was talking about, one of the fixes they did in USPS, um, is that you know they can enter in the primary, secondary, or other email addresses in here. But it has to be an email address from USPS. Obviously, if you're unsure of that, please contact your school administrator. And so this is the email then that is going to be stored on their user account. So, you know, when you go in and look at a user, you'll see, you know, their username, their first, last name, and you'll see the email address. It's going to um, use that then when it's emailing uh, lead notifications or timesheet notifications. And so they're going to enter those three in. And then the externally authenticated, this is if the district's using Active Directory. So if they aren't, they leave that unchecked. And then they're gonna click Create User to proceed with that. And they will get a pop-up notification saying that the operation was successful and, and they, they need to you know, make sure that they read this information so they know what the next step is. A user has been registered using the information entered. So they created a user account in ESS. An email with instructions for changing their password has been set to whatever email address they put in here. And so this then goes in, I may have to make these screens bigger. Um, and this is an example of the email they'll get. So from their district to whoever just created their account and it tells them, you know, this is what you need to do. And based on their configuration for um, password resets, it tells them that it will expire in so-and-so time. And so um, it does include a temporary password here as well. And so, and also the ESS application link. So what's nice about that is what the user can do then when they get that email, they have in this case five minutes to go in, click on this link, copy this temporary password. It'll take them directly to this pop-up men menu where they go in and reset their password to something permanent. So it, it should fill in the username. Um, they paste in the old password, they enter in a new password, and it does give them the security guidelines on creating a new password, plus the uppercase, lowercase, blah, blah, blah. They go ahead, enter it in, verify it again, click on change password, and they are good to go. They've got their account now, they have their permanent password to log into their account, and they can go in and start logging into ESS. Okay, um, we also updated the um, forgot username. I think this one we need a little more work done on. And we updated the forgot password too. So again, if you've got somebody that says, I forgot my password, you know, they're, they've already been in ESS, something happened and they just need to reset it, take them right here and say, okay, we've got it set up. It's in the documentation. You know, this is how you do it. Um, and so again, um, there, it's going to, when they click on the forgot password link, it'll take them to uh, the forgot this pop-up. They go in and enter their username and reset password. They'll get a little confirmation box saying an email with instructions for changing your password has been sent to the email associated with this ESS user account. Whatever that email address is on their ESS user account, gonna send it to that email address. 
And then this is the email they get. And it tells them that, you know, you've got it. We have a temporary password for you. They're set up again for five minutes. They click on this link, which takes them again to the reset password. They can enter in and they now uh, created a permanent password again. And then they can log into ESS. So, you know, this information's in here. Like I said, I may have to make these screens a little bit larger, um, but um, it does, you know, give you an option to send them to this particular area to allow them to go in and um, either self-register or change the password themselves. Okay. Any questions regarding the self-registering? All right, just a, um, a couple other things. Uh, not so much about the recap, like I said, you can go in and, and you know kind of review all of this information that we have out here for August. But I did wanna um, talk about a, a couple other things here. Um, and I wanna go over to um, our JIRA dashboard, um, which is, you know, for those of you that, um, you know, use JIRA, use the dashboard, um, it's a great tool because it helps you um, as an ITC person to know, you know, what's, what's on a feedback request, you know, for ESS or any of the applications, um, you know, what's there for, you know, what's going to be on a next release. Um, and so I went in and just selected the the uh, core project, the ESS JIRA issues. And what I did is I went in, in my dashboard and I selected the fixed version uh, for the upcoming um, ESS versions. And there's, and right now um, Mark's got a couple of them scheduled. Now it doesn't mean that these are actually gonna go, but he's got them scheduled for the next one, which is 2024.8. And so I just went in and just selected those two versions in here. And, and 2024.9, he doesn't have 2024.10 out there yet, but I'm able to see what they're working on. Uh, the developers are working on for the upcoming releases. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to like, just look ahead, right? And just see what's out there. Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk about that as well as the feedback one. We are, you know, receiving a lot of tickets asking about, um, it, do we have a feedback issue? And I just wanted to show you guys that you guys can go out here and take a look at this information yourselves. Um, if you're requesting for one to be increased, that's great. Create the ticket. Um, you know, if you're not quite sure, like how, you know, is it out there? That's fine. Create a ticket. But if you, you know, want to go out there and say, okay, what is sitting out there? What are the ones that are the most requested? You can create a filter in your dashboard. Of, for the feedback project, and you can go in then and um, you know pull up whatever ones you want, which most of them are outstanding because they're feedback issues, right? Um, and then you know you can make sure that the times requested is on your grid. And I just sorted it by you know how, the highest, and I just kind of wanted to give you guys um, just a little blurb on that, or you know just to show you, you know where. You know, you can look this up and see which ones have the most times requested right now. Um, so, you know, these grow and change every day. Um, so, but um, if you're wondering, you know, about some of these, I know calendars is a big one. And, you know, this is the one right here that talks about the calendars. Um, and so, you know, an additional leave request detail that we want to add to calendars. If you're like, what's all included on this feedback issue, you can cl click on that and take a look. So it's not set in stone. There might be things on here that won't be done. It is based on feedback issues is based on what the prioritization working group is going to decide on as to what's going to be done next. Um, so that's not for SSDT to say, it's for the prioritization working group to decide, you know, what would be the, the one that would be, um, you know, very critical that needs to, you know, be out there. Obviously, if it was something where it was a critical one, we would move it to the core project and uh, get that done. Uh, but these are just kind of a wish list, if you will, of enhancements that um, they have requested. And we've just been adding them here. And I know Mark 
looks at this and um, is, you know, trying to, you know, determine, you know, um, you know, discussing this with the prioritization working group as to what, what would you like to start with, you know, so I think they're kind of going through this, at, you know, and going to, I believe, um, I think a survey will be sent out um, to those on the prioritization working group about some of these feedback issues um, in order to decide which ones are the most important that need to be moved to the core project to get done. So, I mean, for him to be looking at this already is great um, because, you know, some of these things will get knocked out sooner rather than later. Um, but yes, we um, think that this would be really helpful for you guys just to you know, go out here and look, you know, and then if you're like, ah, they've got, you know, they've got this one on including leave balances on the Kruger grid. Yes. And, you know, if you just had um, a training session with your districts where you had five districts saying, I need this, um, then let us know, you know, create a ticket and say, I see you guys have a feedback request uh, for including leave balances on the approver grid. I'd like to increase that, you know, by five, because I've got five districts that are needing this. Um, so, so just stuff like that, you know, um, it's worth it. Just, it, it, you know, helps you as well, because, you know, you may get the same question from five different districts. And so you'll see it. Oh, here it is. I'll let them know we have it on here. And then I'll let the CT know that they need to increase the times requested on it. So, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to share some of that with you guys. Um, Let's see. And just to, you know, kind of round off the rest of this here, I'm going to go to our main page here and go down to our meetings and trainings just to see where we're at uh, training wise here. I think we are, I can't, like Lori said, I can't believe we're in September already, but um, obviously we have the uh, OEDSA sessions. Um, so that's kind of our, our focus right now is getting ready for those. We have uh, four sessions, actually five. We're doing one just for ITCs only after Thursday um, regarding um, conversion information, um, converting to state software. So with that, we also have, and you probably already know, we've got ESS um, timesheets, we've got um, uh, payroll and a USAS session. So those are the, the four sessions that we're going to have there. Um, and then I don't believe our next Fridays with Fisc Fiscal is until September 27th. We're going to go into uh, lesser known options. And then um, in October, we're very busy with, um, we've got um, SSD Direct on the road. So um, Support staff is going out there, and we're going to uh, Meta Columbus, um, the ESC that's uh, next door to them. They're going to be hosting. We're going then on to Maveca um, the next day, and then Spoka on the final day. So that was sent out in the last newsletter. So please, you know, if if you haven't, let your districts know that um, you know those sessions we out there on the uh, SSD Direct. Um, wiki page, we do have um, a schedule of what, you know, an agenda of what we're planning to cover those days, same topics um, at each location. Um, so if your, you know, districts are interested in that, have them go in here and click on registration to sign up for those sessions. So we'd love to see them. And one other thing I wanted to finish off with is, um, our next newsletter, um, I know I think our last newsletter, we talked about all of this um, and where we're going to be. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention, too, is we are going to be at SupportCon this year, um, October 17th. We're doing a learning lab session. Um, so I, I think we have a couple hours on that day. We're going to be covering USAS and payroll topics there. So again, we're just busy, busy, busy <laughs> these next couple months, uh, which is good. Um, but uh, our next newsletter uh, that's coming out in September is going to be um, an, a, a big article on ESS. We're going to talk about ESS, try to get some demo links 
in the newsletter, uh, timesheets, absence management, and just throw that all into one large article to keep districts informed as to uh, what's going on with employee self-service. So I think phew, that I've covered everything there. Um, do you guys have any questions? Okay, see that, got that fixed, Tammy, great. Okay, if you guys don't have any other further questions, I don't think I forgot anything. Um, I wanna thank you guys for attending today's recap session. You guys have a great week and we'll see you next week at OETSA.